Hi everyone, so welcome back to the second half. Yeah, my name's Akasha Mitra, for those of you that I don't know. There's a few people here that I don't know, so uh, yeah, Akasha Mitra. I'm going to be talking uh, for the rest, well, not the rest of the evening. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? Until 11.59. You always sat there going, yeah, I don't know more. Uh, no, I'm going to be talking in the second half. And uh, we're actually starting a new series this evening, uh, which we're calling Bante Classics. And that is, uh, the order members on the team have each picked a kind of favourite uh, teaching uh, of Sangharakshita, who was the founder of our order and community. And we're just going to be reflecting on that teaching a little bit, um, uh, talking about, about those teachings. Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. Um, so I thought I'd just say a little bit about Sangharakshita, because... Um, uh, I've been coming here for quite a long time, and um, I, I sort of realised recently, I, I think I often make this assumption that people know who Sangharakshita is, and um, you know, a lot of you won't, particularly if you're a, a bit newer, um, but he was the founder of our, uh, our order, so he was an English man who was born in, uh, I think, 1925, and uh, he grew up in uh, Tooting, just down the road. Uh, and he went to India during the Second World War, and he stayed on at the end of the Second World War. Uh, through, you know, th this almost seems like sort of fate sort of dealing a hand in his life. He was conscripted to India. He got interested in Buddh Buddhism before he went, and he was conscripted of all places to India. So he just stayed on at the end of the war and had a period of wandering in India, basically, like just going from place to place, looking for teachers, uh, sort of more or less living as a monk. And then he was actually ordained as a monk at a certain point. Uh, and, uh, and then he came back to Britain in the mid-60s and uh, set up, uh, well, a new Buddhist movement, the Tree Ratna Buddhist Order, or the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order, as it was then. Um, and, uh, yeah, he kind of dedicated his life, really, to um, setting up this community. He was the main teacher in, in our community. And all of us that are sort of um, part of the Tree Ratna Buddhist Order and community, in a way, are his disciples and the, the sort of disciples of his disciples. Um, so that's a little bit about him. I thought I'd just say a little bit about him personally as well, before I actually start the talk. So... Um, just a little bit about my contact with him. So I didn't know him well, um, but I feel immensely grateful to him. Um, I mean, my life uh, is, has changed beyond belief due to my contact with him and people that have been inspired by him. So I feel very, very grateful. Um, I met him three times in my life. And they were, they were very, very different um, experiences of meeting him. And I thought I'd just say a little bit about that at the start, just because I think there's actually something in it that relates to the talk as well. So the first time I met him, I was very young. I think I was about 22, and I was very new to Buddhism. And I didn't really sort of have a sense of who he was. Um, but I went along to this dinner party where there was like five or six of us that met him. And... Um, my experience of him was actually quite difficult, so I, can't, I don't really remember that much about it. I don't remember whether I sort of had expectations or uh, what I was sort of expecting. But it was very interesting because he completely refused to make small talk with me. So I sort of, I met him <laughs> and um, I was having a conversation, sort of trying to have a conversation with him and I said to him, um, uh, you know, where, where are you, something like have you been to Liverpool before this was where it was it was in Liverpool and he said yes <laughs> and I said um, oh right where, where are you uh, where are you staying and he said in a hotel <laughs> and I was like, okay and uh, so where's the, where's the um, where's the uh, where's the hotel he said it's in Sefton Park I said right I said it's really nice one there isn't it yes and I was just completely sort of bamboozled, really. I thought, OK. And uh, I can't really remember what happened then, but we sort of spent the rest of the evening and, you know, we were just having sort of conversation, that sort of thing. But he, my experience of him was I felt he didn't really come out to me at all. Um, and then I met him about 10 years later, 
when I'd sort of got re-involved, I'd had a period of not being around the Sangha or community, and then I got re-involved, and I'd started practicing Buddhism much more seriously, and I was quite committed, and I felt a tremendous sense of gratitude to him. So I went to see him, only wanting to express my gratitude, and only wanting to sort of, um, well, to do that really, in a very sort of heartfelt way. And it was completely different. He, um, we had a conversation for about an hour where we talked about all sorts of things. He, I'd lived in India when I was younger as well, and we were talking about that, living in Calcutta, and talking about Buddhism, and talking about the London Buddhist Centre, and uh, it was just absolutely lovely. And I came out just glowing, just feeling like, you know, absolutely sort of warm and radiant from his presence. Um, I also took him a gift, which was a friend of mine, a mutual friend of ours actually, a friend of his and a friend of mine, had died not long before that, and she was an artist. And I took him one of her paintbrushes, and I thought maybe he would like something of hers, because I inherited a lot of her possessions. And I sort of gave him this paintbrush, and my closing image of him was as I was leaving. Well, he took it, and he said, he said, oh, now that is a gift, isn't it? And he took it and sort of really reverentially sort of put it on his shrine. And I thought, oh, gosh, that's so lovely. Um, and that was the second time I met him. And then the third and final time I met him was the same thing. It was like he came towards me even more. Like I used to do a lot of stuff in the world of experimental music and sound art. And I was doing a kind of an installation piece at the time using gramophones. And he seemed to know a lot about gramophones and was telling me how shellac discs are made and this sort of thing. And I thought, God, that's incredible, you know. And he really came, sort of, really met me on some level. And then I came away from that encounter, not really feeling like anything had happened, but feeling really, really opened up. I was on retreat and I sat next to somebody at lunch. They were having quite a difficult time. I somehow just felt like I knew exactly what to say or that I could really communicate well with this person. I think it was from being in his presence. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, but yeah, very, very different experiences. And it was a lot to do with sort of what I brought to the encounters, I think. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd say a little bit about Bante personally to start with. Um, but what I'm going to talk about this evening is this, uh, is a lecture that he gave in 1970 called Mind Reactive and Creative. Um, so I've got this uh, transcript here and it's sort of an old pamphlet. Um, but you can actually download this for free. There's a free PDF online and I recommend uh, doing that. I'm just going to sort of uh, uh, not summarise it, but just sort of uh, look at some key areas of the talk this evening. Um, but there's a lot more in it than, than what I'm going to say. Um, so where Bante starts and where, where, he, he, um, where the lecture starts uh, and where he says Buddhism starts is uh, with the mind, basically. So that's where he starts, is pointing out that Buddhism starts with the mind. And he draws, uh, he underlines this with two quotes from different Buddhist traditions. So one from the Zen tradition, which I'm not going to talk about, and then a quote from the Dhammapada, which is an ancient Buddhist text, which is as close to the words of the Buddha as we can get. Um, and the quote from the Dhammapada is, experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. If one speaks or acts with, a, with an impure mind, suffering follows like I always trip up on this bit. <laughs> Suffering follows like the cartwheel uh, following the hoof of the ox that's pulling the cartwheel. You get the impression. Uh, but the important thing is experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. And then the inverse is true. If one speaks or acts with a pure mind, this is a lovely line, uh, happiness follows like a shadow that never departs. So he sort of uses this to underline something at the start of the lecture about the primacy of the mind. Um, but I want to sort of, I want to pause on that a little bit and say, actually, let's, let's look at that a little bit, really. Um, I mean, when I say that, experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. So our experiences, how we experience the world, that is preceded by our mind. Mind comes first, 
do do you think that's true? Does that ring true for you? What do you what do you think of that? Does that sound true to you? No, it doesn't sound true to Kusla Sara. Okay. <laughs> Worrying coming from a Buddhist. But, um, I think yeah, I'll say, I, yeah, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. What about anyone else? Could you say it one more time I'm so sorry? Yeah, experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. Yeah, go on. Well, I think when I definitely when I started uh, doing these practices, my <coughs> idea of mind mm. was like my thoughts and what I was thinking and mm. sort of what mm. I could imagine mm. all of mm. that. And if you consider that as your mind, yeah. I would say no, yeah. because like yeah. I can't change how I feel about stuff or yeah. how I'm thinking about things doing that. But if it's, <coughs> but now kind of have this broader view of like, almost <laughs> every, everything you're doing. Like, I don't know, it's kind of like the view, the view of the mind has broadened now to the mm. point where it's like almost everything in my life is my mind in some way. Right. And in that sense, it feels a lot more true. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't so know. it's almost a feeling that your mind affects every area of your life, is that what you're saying? Or Yeah, but it's also part of every aspect of my life. If you know what I mean? It's like hard to draw the boundaries sometimes mm, between, mm, mm. Um, like, what's in your head and what yeah. uh, what is outside of your. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I say in your head. That's another. Di- well, di- that's the me. thing. Like, it's not all in yeah, my head. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I think that's the thing. Is like, I'm not going to get into a sort of a kind of metaphysical discussion about what is mind. I don't think this this talk is the place for that but in a way it's mysterious isn't it what do we actually even mean by our mind and i'm going to say a little bit more about that as we go on but um yeah i was reading this and i i love that quote from the dhammapada it speaks to me on some level on some level i believe it but a bit like kuslasara on some level i don't quite believe it uh you know on i was thinking about this i was thinking well what with one part of me, what do I believe? And it's like, I think what I sort of believe is that there is an experience out there and that somehow this comes to, you know, there's an experience that comes to me and there's sort of a filter going on here or something like that, like my mind affects my experience. But to say that that it's preceded by mind, led by mind and produced by mind, which is that my experiences are actually a result of my mind uh, is quite radical, I think. On some level, I believe that. Uh, and when I'm at my best, I can see that and I can experience that. But there's part of me that doesn't believe it. You know, there's part of me that thinks that there's sort of an experience out there and then somehow there's some sort of interaction between the two. Um, so it's quite radical, I think, isn't it? Um, And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, in one translation, it actually says experience is is preceded by mind and mind is their chief. You know, that's that's another translation, which is quite significant, isn't it? You know, it's like one begets the other, basically. Um, And this line about when one speaks or acts with a pure mind, uh, what that means is ethically pure. So it's not pure in the sense of, well, we might misunderstand that term, you know, we might think it means, I don't know, I don't know what it brings to mind for you, sort of, I don't know, virginal or something, or, you know, it's nothing to do with that, it's ethically pure, which means that our mind is coming from a place of uh, generosity, uh, expansiveness, uh, wisdom, openness, uh, and that then creates the experience that we have, as opposed to the opposite, which is if we're coming from an experience of uh, you know, a negative mental state uh, and not really, not really seeing how the world is, uh, then that shuts us down, basically. Um, and this line, happiness follows like a shadow that never departs, I think that's a, such a beautiful image, isn't it? You know, can we even imagine that? Uh, you know, happiness that never departs. Uh, you know, it's such a, a sort of beautiful idea, isn't it? And w- actually what the Buddha is saying is that that is available to us. Uh, but it's to do with what we do with our mind, basically. It's to do with how much uh, awareness that we have. Um, hmm. 
So I also sort of wonder if we if we uh, if we actually imagine that skillful action will lead to happiness. Uh, you know, is that what we really think is the case? When we think of happiness, fulfilment, all of that sort of thing, is it acting skillfully? Is it acting, say, for example, uh, in terms of generosity? You know, do we believe that actually that will make us happy? Is that, is that what we believe? Is that what you believe? You're all being very quiet this evening. You can <laughs> say something. Up to a point, maybe. Up to a point, yeah. Can you say more? Yeah, like I'm happy being... Ge I feel great being generous until it hits a point where I feel like, oh, I kind of want this now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I gave you some stuff. Right. I yeah, don't yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. now. So we sort of put a lid on that, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think so. I noticed that as well. Go on, Pete. Um, yeah, I think like this whole thing of like a shadow that's never broken. Or is that never broken? That never departs. That never departs. And, and the idea of pure, it, it kind of, it gives a sort of perfection aspect to it all. Uh, mm. Like 100% ethical and you're going to be 100% happy. Mm. And that to me feels, it's like an ideal, right? It's like mm. totally idealistic. I, part of me believes it and part of me thinks, well, is that real? Is that just yeah. a kind of a, yeah, a, yeah. a carrot? Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like we can't we can't just jump to that. So we're working with the parts of ourselves that don't quite believe it is an ideal. You know, it's like we have this image of the Buddha on the shrine. This is the ideal. You know, it's it's represented in such a way to uh, you know that 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 golden skin, that poise. It means something. Like it's that happiness, that 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 absolute contentment. Uh, the joy that comes from uh, from that kind of mind uh, that means something. It's the ideal, and actually, what we're trying to do is sort of close that gap. But yeah, I notice how I put a lid on that myself. A bit like you were saying with generosity, I sort of think, okay, well, I'll do this, but I won't do this, you know. And it's almost like I then I then sort of put uh, put a lid on my own happiness. Um, what are, we, what are we told will lead to happiness? Like, what's the received wisdom in our society? What, what are we told will make us happy? Biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> Who told you that biscuits are made? Yeah. My mum. Your mum. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Money. Shopping. Money, shopping, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Relationships. Say again? Relationships. Relationships, yeah, yeah. So a certain kind of relationship. Perfect. Yeah. Career. Yeah. A career, yeah. Sex. Success. Oh, I didn't say that. Hey, Jim, Success, yeah. I'm slightly thinking, I think I slightly said that because I've got an example in mind in a moment. Uh -huh. but yeah, so all of these things we're sort of told, aren't we? What will make us happy, and it's uh, there's a there's a kind of a there's a, a sort of a yeah all of these things that we know that we're told you know advertising sort of tells us this you know if you do this if you do X if you do Y you'll be happy, um, and also um, in a society where there's an expectation we should be doing many many projects okay. surrounded by with many many friends right okay. That's an expectation. Eh? So is that like a thing of sort of busyness or something? Or what yeah, I've been really, really busy. Right, right, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you have, you, just, yeah, you're like, you're not, you're not living a worthwhile life if you're not very busy. If you're not really, really busy and interacting yeah, yeah. with a lot yeah. of people yeah, yeah. and yeah. having lots of things yeah. on the go all the time, it's yeah. all very exhausting. Yes, yeah, interesting. So I was thinking about this, I've just finished a biography of um, uh, somebody called Moby, I don't know if you people remember Moby, so I'm slightly showing my age there, but I still think of him as relatively contemporary, but <laughs> he's actually probably like in the oldies pile now, isn't he, but he's sort of, he was kind of like around in the 90s, had a, and then he, he disappeared for a while and he came back in the, in the like about 2007-2008 released one album which went stratospherically, uh, uh, sold millions and millions and millions of copies, like tens of millions of copies. And I've just read this biography of him called Then It Fell Apart. And it's interesting, like, 
this biography is just like chapter after chapter after chapter of him desperately having all of these things that he always wanted, like uh, lots of sex, lots of money, lots of success, huge houses, loads of recognition, fame, all of these sorts of things, which he craved when he was growing up. He had a very, very difficult upbringing. And he always thought, if I get these things, that will make me happy. And it's just chapter after chapter after chapter of him, like, it's almost like the image that comes to mind is just bumping up against that again and again, like banging his head against this brick wall, desperately wanting these things that he's doing to make him happy, not seeing that they're making him more and more and more miserable. And that the whole arc of the book is sort of like you just thinking like stop doing this to yourself <laughs> and then at a certain point the penny starts to drop and he realizes sort of how he's behaving and you know at that moment there is some awareness that comes in uh, so there's an awareness that comes in and he's sort of seeing the effect that his actions are actually having up until that point what he's doing is he's he's sort of um He's enacting this thing that he thinks is true, but he's not really looking at the evidence because it's so kind of ingrained in him that he thinks, oh, well, you know, we're told all of these things will make me happy. I have these things now, therefore I must be happy. And it takes him a long time to admit to himself that actually he's thoroughly miserable, he's getting worse and worse, and uh, that something needs to change, basically. Um, so I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about my own experience, uh, which is nothing like Moby's. Uh, but I was contrasting that with my own experience of the last uh, sort of couple of weeks, which is I, I just came back on Monday from two weeks away. And um, I spent two weeks uh, cycling through the north of England and Northumberland and then Scotland and then up into an area called Trossachs. And then when I got to the Trossachs, like a national park in Scotland, and I did a week's solitary retreat. Um, now, I, I know from years of experience that something like that is going to bring happiness, actually. Uh, and, but still, there's part of me that doesn't quite believe that. I still think, um, you know, parts of me that think other things are going to bring me happiness. There I was, uh, you know, cycling long distances each day so I was cycling like 60 70 miles a day and then stopping and seeing friends a lot of friends in the sangha and then got to this place had a week solitary retreat <coughs> and all I did on that retreat was pretty much nothing uh, and a lot of meditation and a little bit of swimming in a lock uh, you know I didn't need anything else I just needed to let my mind settle and be calm for you know a week or so and I, mostly I just did nothing actually I did some Buddhist ritual in the evening like I say I did some meditation and I was it, I was so happy like I honestly it was a bit it was almost a bit too much at points actually <laughs> uh, like I remember coming off the retreat cycling into the nearest town um, I actually came off to the re off the retreat to a message from Pranyamanis, which was really lovely. And uh, I really loved Pranyamanis, uh, but that day, like, I really loved him. <laughs> so, so I got a message from Pranyamanis, and it's the London Buddhist Centre, and I just felt so full of love and appreciation. And I felt that for everyone in my life. Yeah, you know, this real urge to just, like, get in touch with people, just make contact with people, connect with people, and just, I felt just joyful, absolutely joyful. Uh, and that came from uh, two weeks of just being aware of my mind and not really doing very much, you know, putting away my phone, not scrolling through YouTube, not doing, you know, a lot of the things that I usually do, just doing that, you know, you know living in a place that was like, you know, the size of this, basically, for a week. That was it. Like, probably happier than I've ever been in my life. Um, so I just wanted to say something about that, really, and sort of conditions and what, what actually leads to happiness and what doesn't. And what Bante's saying is, it's, uh, it, 
it's working creatively with our mind that leads to happiness. So it's, it's basically having some awareness, seeing the consequences of what we're doing, and having enough awareness to put the conditions in place that actually will lead to happiness and not what we think will lead to happiness, and paying attention uh, to what works and what doesn't. So, I'm wondering whether to pause there. Oh, does anybody, any, anybody want to ask anything about that so far? Is there any questions or? Yes. What is happiness? What is it? Yeah. I don't know. I, can't, I don't know if I could define it, but I, I think we all have a sense of what it feels like. Um, what I would say about happiness, I've been using that word happiness. I think, actually, uh, happiness can sort of come and go. My experience is that a sense of fulfilment is, is really what I'm talking about. And happiness sort of hangs around fulfilment, if that makes sense. I th what I really am talking about is a sense of fulfilment, a sense that one is in the right place, doing the right thing, a sense that things are aligned and that things make sense and things are clear. Does that, is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Why do you, and why do you ask? I like those kind of questions. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because often we talk about something like happiness and it's interesting because I'm not, yeah, I don't know if happiness is actually the main thing that I mean. I think happiness is there, but actually often happiness is a byproduct of doing, of doing you know, the kind of things that I've talked about, or, li or living a sort of an ethical, uh, ethical life, basically. Yeah. Yes, Jay-Z. At what point did your mind start to settle? Was it during your retreat, or was it during when you were cycling? No, it was when I was cycling, actually. I mean, it's interesting that you and I have talked about this quite a lot because I know you're a keen cyclist as well. And that's one of the reasons why I really like cycling. I particularly like cycling over very long distances. And I'm not recommending that you all do this. We each have our own ways of finding sort of inner peace and stillness, don't we? But for me, I love cycling for seven, eight, nine hours at a stretch. And I think one of the things I love about it is I do, it just allows my mind to calm right down. It's a little bit, I'm not going to say it's like meditation because I, I can't stand it when people say, oh, going to the gym is my meditation. <laughs> it's not meditation, but it has a meditative aspect to it. Sorry if I'm offended. <laughs> oh, you know, it's like, where do you draw the line with that? You know, oh, I think, you know, I don't know. Smashing up my fridge with a sledgehammer in my meditation. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a meditative aspect to it, which is that it, it allows the mind to calm, to calm right down, basically. You know, you, you're not having to think too much. Um, you're just making minor adjustments all the time. So you're paying attention in the way that you would in meditation, and you're sort of adjusting when you need to. And there's just a sense of space and a sense of openness. Um, so, yeah, that, that I, I found that it's helpful for me. But we'll all have our versions of that. People often talk about going for walks in the country or something like that, don't they? I'm not really into that myself. But, um, uh, you know, it's, we'll know what enables our mind to sort of calm down. Um, so, yeah. Yes? Just going back to the um, mind cart yeah. horse analogy mm. um, there's the mind the thought the action and then the reception and you are not in any way in control of what the reception will be how do you then reconcile the loop of what you I, come back to? I would say hold on to that because I'm going to come on to that in a bit so I'm going to talk about that and and what shows up in our mind and what we do with it and okay. so if I haven't answered your question by the end of this evening uh, we can we can talk about that, but yeah, hold that for the moment. Um, okay, so Bante talks about two kinds of mind. Um, so he talks about the absolute mind and the relative mind. Uh, and the absolute mind, um, well, there's a lovely description of it actually here. I wonder whether to read this or not. Um, maybe I will read it. Uh, Yeah, so he says, by absolute, by absolute mind is meant that infinite cosmic or transcendental awareness within whose pure timeless flow 
the subject-object polarity as we ordinary ex ordinarily experience it is forever dissolved. Yeah, which I think is it's quite a thing, isn't it? Um, what a beautiful kind of poetic description. And what he's talking about there is a kind of transpersonal mind. So it's almost like mind with a big M, or like consciousness with a big C. It's not our individual mind or consciousness. It's the greater consciousness or the greater mind, um, which is what the Buddha is fully in the whole time. Uh, it's that consciousness which uh, is sort of, what could you say? I mean, concepts start to break down here, but you could say uh, that's where enlightened beings live. You know, it's that... Um, uh, well, yeah, maybe I won't say too much about that, actually. But what I do want to say is... Uh, is um, uh, yeah, so that's absolute mind. And relative mind uh, is, uh, is, our, is our personal experience of our mind. So it's what, ha what is happening in our own mind from day to day. Uh, and then within that, uh, there are two kinds of relative mind. There's reactive, the reactive mind, and the creative mind. And this is the sort of the crux of the lecture, really. Um, so he's keen to point out that there aren't actually two minds. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a concept, it's a sort of, a, it's a metaphor designed for us to help us uh, um, sort of see what our mind is doing. But what he says is there's a reactive mind and a creative mind. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about what those two minds do or how they function. So the reactive mind, he says, doesn't actually act, but it reacts. Um, so uh, he, the way he talks about it is it's not actually even us initiating action. It's more like the mind using us in the sense that we are a kind of a slave to it, basically. Uh, so it doesn't act out of itself, but it's just constantly reacting in habitual ways to stimuli. So an example of that would be, I don't know, uh, we, see, we see an advert and we're kind of influenced by it and we want to go out and buy that product, for example. Or somebody says something difficult to us and we respond in a habitual, uh, I don't know, kind of a, a tight way or something like that. Um, how Bante refers to this is he calls it the penny in the slot mentality. Uh, I mean, partly that tells you how old the lecture is. It's from 1970, uh, so when a penny was actually worth something. Uh, but he's actually, you know, he's saying you, you put you put the penny in the slot, and uh, you know, out comes the Beatles' latest single or something like that. I don't know whatever it was back then. Um, but it's you're, It's basically just responding to uh, it's responding to stimuli. Uh, and it's mechanical and it's repetitive um, so it's a, it's a habitual way of responding and he's quite strong about this he says, he says um, it's, it's almost like that kind of mind is asleep or dead even so he talks about it as a, as a kind of a dead mind um, and the important thing is that it's not free uh, so there's another lecture of Bante's where he talks about uh, enlightenment as a taste of freedom. And what he's saying here is that reactive mind, that way of responding all the time, where there's no actual awareness there and it's just us responding to stimuli, that is as if we were asleep. Because uh, we're, we're not really uh, acting in any way, we're just responding to stimuli. Um, so there's a sort of mechanical sense about that, basically. Um, and he says, when we wake up to the fact that we're asleep, that is when the spiritual life begins. So that's where our journey to enlightenment begins. When we wake up to the fact that we're asleep. And most of you will probably know this, but you know the word Buddha uh, means one who is awakened. So it's a title, it's not his name, it means one who is awake. And what we need to do is awaken to the fact that we are actually asleep. Um, do we recognise that? Do we? Do you accept that? Yeah, I mean, it's quite strong, isn't it, to say that we're actually just asleep most of the time, uh, you know? But it can sort of 
it can feel like that sometimes, can't it? It's like, you know, if, if, we're, um, if we're sort of stuck in that mode. So that's the reactive mind. Um, and the creative mind is the opposite. So he says it doesn't react, but it responds. Um, and interestingly, he describes it as optimistic, which I think is quite an interesting word to use. And he, d he says it's optimistic because it's capable of transcending conditions and even unpleasant conditions. So it doesn't matter what conditions, uh, say, for example, with the Buddha, it wouldn't matter what external conditions he was in. Uh, he could be, I don't know, sat in a bath full of cow dung with like somebody blasting noise into his ear or something like that. And still, he would have this beautiful, open, expansive, generous, kind, loving mind. Like, it's hard for us to imagine that, isn't it? Not being influenced by our conditions around us. Um, but it, it, it's completely free of conditions, basically. Completely, it's possible to completely transcend conditions. Um, and I think it's interesting for us to reflect on that a little bit, isn't it? Is, okay, well, how, how are we responding to what is going on around us? Are we awake to that? Are we aware? Do we actually know what we're doing? Uh, but I was also thinking about this in relation to, I think what it means is it's not just the conditions that are around us. It's actually our conditioning. So we all have a biography and a set of conditions that we are, you know, that we, I don't know what you could say, are carrying along with us. Uh, so, you know, things to do with our upbringing, things to do with where we were raised, ideas we were raised with, that sort of thing. And part of this creative mind is actually, over time, getting beyond our habitual ways of responding because of our conditioning or because of how, how we, uh, you know, because of the particular patterns that we have had in our past. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this particularly part of my trip was I cycled up through Northumberland and um, I come from a town in the north of England called Berwick-upon-Tweed. It's the most northerly town in England. It's only about four miles south of Edinburgh, latitude, latitudinally, is that the word? <coughs> anyway, you know what I mean. Um, and uh, I, that's where I was raised, but I haven't been back there for about 15 years. I don't have any friends or family there now, but it was, a, it was very, very strong, my experience of growing up there. Very, very formative. And I went back and just visited the town and was kind of walking around and looking at places that I'd been as a teenager. And I was so different back then. Uh, I was just such a different person. Um, you know, I was, uh, I used to drink a lot. I used to take a lot of drugs. I was desperately used to just crave excitement. I couldn't wait to leave this town. I was, you know, just all the things that you have going on when you're that sort of age. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, it's, it often feels to me like when I look back on that person 30 years ago, I, I cannot even sometimes imagine that that's actu it's actually possible to be those two people in one lifetime. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. It's like I've been on such a journey since then that I, I, I recognise that person. I feel a warmth towards that person, but it, do it doesn't feel like me, actually. And some of the things, when I look back on some of the things that I used to do and say. Um, so I think it means conditioning in that way as well. It's not just conditioning in the sense of like, oh, you know, if I come and hit you over the head with a cushion or something like that. Um, so Bante talks about this as well and says that when it's functioning on the highest level, so when the creative mind is functioning on the highest level, uh, it becomes... Uh, it becomes, uh, it actually raises itself to the level of absolute mind. So that's it at its, at its height, basically. And it's operating out of a sense of freedom. Uh, he says it's freedom itself, uh, it's fullness, it's brightness. He talks about it as being intensely and radiantly alive. Um, and he uses this lovely phrase where he says, it loves where there is no reason to love, which I thought is so beautiful. Like, it's just one line in the lecture. It's one thing that he says, but I think, God, you could just, you could just pay attention to that. And there's so much there. It's beautiful. Loving where there's no reason to love. 
And I was thinking about this experience that I'd had when I was away, where I just felt like my heart was so open. I remember having a lot of conversations with people where I'd just be there and somehow, uh, yeah, I just want to talk to people. I just, you know, or somehow people wanted to talk to me and making these lovely connections with people that I'd never sort of met before. Um, and I was reflecting on this and I was thinking like, why is that the case and why is that not always possible? And it's, I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that when we're communicating with people often, it's like we subtly want something or we want to influence the, what, you know, the, the interaction in some way. It's like we've got an agenda or we've got something in us that is sort of perfuming the interaction. And actually when that's gone, and there's just kind of awareness and meta and compassion, uh, it's a completely different experience. And that, that's when we get to that thing that Bante was saying about loving where there's no reason to love. So when somebody is in that state, and I think Bante is a very good example of this. So this thing that I was saying before about Bante, when I went to see him the second and third time, we didn't have particularly profound conversations but he was radiating something. Like I came away just feeling alive and energized and uh, just sort of uh, vivified. And uh, it's, it's like he was communicating something all of the time because of the depth of his practice, because of inhabiting this creative mind. Um, he, he's just communicating something. And actually what he's communicating is himself. You know, he used to formally teach and so on, but actually, much more than that, he's just communicating what it's like to be in that mind. Uh, this put me in mind of, um, I actually, I spoke about this lecture quite a few years ago, about seven or eight years ago, and it, when I spoke about it then, I spent a bit of time talking about John Cage, who's a composer that I really admire. And his, he was influenced by um, uh, Suzuki, who was a Zen teacher, and he said that Suzuki just used to, the first time he saw him, he used to come into this room and give a lecture. And he'd come in and he'd just sort of open his books and go over to the window and stare out the window and then come back and say something that Cage didn't really understand. And it's hard to see how that actually, why then did he, did that lead to some sort of awakening for him, which it clearly did. But it's to do with Suzuki actually just communicating himself even when he didn't seem to actually be saying very much or doing very much. Um, Bante has this phrase that he often says, which is, it says that it was, the Dharma is caught and not taught. And that's just basically like a being like this will just perfume the atmosphere with how he is. Uh, and that's what we're able to do the more we inhabit that creative mind. So the other thing to say about this as well is that the creative mind, it doesn't necessarily mean creative in the sense of, uh, you know, like a, that we think of like a musician or an artist or something like that. It may be that, and great works of art can communicate something of this to us. I think when artists are very, very inspired and they're in touch with something like this, they can communicate that through their art. Uh, and that's often why we feel very, very inspired when we're looking at painting or listening to a piece of music or so on. Uh, but it's, it's not necessarily always the case. Uh, it doesn't necessarily just mean that. It also means, well, it's like what I said, basically. It means being in the world in a certain way. How beings communicate, uh, you know, building community, that sort of thing. Uh, and obviously, uh, not all art sort of springs from that state of mind, basically. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit at the moment, in a moment, Bante sort of uses a couple of different models to illustrate this, and I'll say a bit about that in a moment. But I just wanted to pause again and see if anybody has any questions, or if people at home, uh, for people that are watching online, if you've got anything you'd like to ask. Hmm. Liam, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're going to answer this in the next bit, but um, I guess it's about the creative mind approach. Because... Um, I guess through spiritual teachers that I've listened to, I have a big thing. Well, when something comes up that's uncomfortable, or yeah, so it comes up in my mind. My straight away, my approach is to watch it and kind of let it pass through because you yeah. don't have any control on the mind. So um, sorry, say the last bit again. You watch it because um, because you, you don't really have control 
I feel like you don't have control to a certain degree over what arises in your mind. Mm. Um, but then sometimes I get caught up in, well, should I take more of an active mm. approach mm. or mm. should I like let it what, watch it and watch it pass through? Yes. I'm, I will say a little bit more about this, but I'm, I'm just going to answer your question as well because I think it's very, very important. I'm gonna, I'll say more about this as we go on, but that point you made about not having control about what arises in the mind is true. Like, in a sense, what arises in the mind is we do have control over that, but by the time it arises, you don't then have control over it because it's the fruit of past karma, basically. So what arises in the mind is to do with what you've been doing uh, previous to that and when it arises you don't then at that point have control over it but you do have control over how you respond to it and that's what you're talking about this is what Bante is talking about which is do you react you know is it reactive mind or do you take a creative response to that and your response is a creative one which is you try and exercise some awareness to that you try and create space around that and you don't just then uh, respond habitually. So a habitual response would be, I don't know, uh, it's different for different people, isn't it? Reaching for some food or for a drink or for the internet or whatever it is. And actually sitting in awareness is, you know, that's a creative act. That's the creative mind at work. What then happens is you create space for something else to arise. I'm going to say a little bit more about that, but yeah, it's very well put. So Bante introduces two models to talk about this. So he talks about the wheel and the spiral. Uh, and these are, these are sort of traditional Buddhist models. Um, and I want to talk first of all about the wheel of life. Um, so we've got this image on the shrine here. It's uh, traditionally it's called the Bhava Chakra, which means the wheel of becoming. And you'll see here that you have these segments uh, so you, at the middle, you've got uh, a cock, a snake, and a pig, which represents what's traditionally in Buddhism called the three poisons, uh, which are greed, hatred, and delusion. And those negative mental states are basically pushing this wheel around. And then you have people in different uh, realms there. So you have, uh, you have the animal realm, uh, the human realm, the God realm, what's called the Asura realm, which is also called the Titan realm, which is basically like, well, I'll say a little bit about each of them, actually, and I'm going to zero in on a couple. So the God realm is basically where everything's great and everything's just enjoyable all the time and people are just delighting in sense experience and there's no problems and there's no suffering or anything like that. Um, the human realm... Uh, is where, well, you know what it's like to be human. We're all human. Uh, you know, there is happiness, there is also pain. Uh, you know, there are, there are uh, sort of ups and downs, basically. Um, uh, but it's possible for us as humans, to the degree that we, uh, that we cultivate awareness, to actually learn and to sort of grow through our experience. Uh, there are also the, what's called the Asuras, which are like, um, they're co sometimes called jealous gods. And what they're doing is they're kind of vying for power, basically. They're obsessed by uh, power and sort of egotism and control. Um, and then there's the animal realm, which is basically like, uh, uh, well, you know, animals. But Bante talks about this as, uh, with, the, with this kind of wheel image, you can see it as actual realms, i.e. lifetimes. Are you reborn as a god? Are you reborn as an asura? Are you reborn as an animal? But it's also possible to see it as psychological states that we inhabit, uh, you know, and that we pass through these regularly. Um, so, you know, saying basically some people are just behaving as little more than animals. So when we're, when we're completely in the reactive mind, that's basically like us living as animals. There's no creativity there. There's no self-awareness there. There's no um, uh, awareness of what we're doing or the effect that it's having or anything like that. We're basically just interested in like food, sleep, sex, whatever it is that animals are interested in. Um, so I just wanted to spotlight a couple of these. Um, 
I mean, the thing about this is, um, it's with the wheel of with the wheel of life. The important thing is that it's round and round, basically. So there are ups and downs, but it's basically just more of the same, and there's no sense of progress while you're there. There might be ups and downs within that, but there's no overall sense of progress. Um, there's no. Um, uh, it's not sort of cumulative. It doesn't go anywhere in a sense. It's just going round and round. Um, I was thinking about this because I watched a couple of films at the weekend, and um, not at the weekend, in the last week or so. I watched one at the weekend and then one last week. And uh, one was The Wolf of Wall Street, and one was Barbie. Um, <laughs> um, hey, don't laugh. Barbie's amazing. Who's seen it? Only a few of you. I highly recommend it. It's so good. Um, but I also watched The Wolf of Wall Street. I don't know if has anybody seen that. Um, yeah. Oh, dear me. I just thought it was quite grotesque at points. Wouldn't recommend it, actually, if you've not seen it. But, like, this, you know, story of this guy that's just, like, a combination of animal realm and titan realm, just obsessed with ego, domination, just craving, like, loads of drugs, loads of sex, no awareness of the effect of his actions on other people, like, just crashing through life, intent on sort of glorifying himself and, you know, with disastrous consequences, basically. Um, and that just gets sort of more and more so. It just feels like through the film, it's just more and more and more sort of craving, basically. Um, and then with Barbie, I thought it was interesting. Like, for those of you that have seen the film, or those of you that haven't even, it's a bit like she's in a God realm to start with. She's in this realm where everything's perfect. Uh, and then there's a funny scene. I'm not giving too much away here. It's not really that important. There's a scene where they're all kind of dancing in this disco. And she says... Does anybody ever think about death? And it's like there's a moment where everybody's like, <gasps> like you can't say that, you know. And it's almost like there's a moment of awareness for her. Um, and it's a bit like the Buddha, you know, the story of the four sights, where the Buddha leaves the palace and sees an old person, a sick person, a dead person. And he can't go back to his old life after that. Uh, and it's the same with Barbie. She's having these thoughts about death. And she can't then exist in this world anymore because it's like this perfect world where nothing ever goes wrong. And she knows there's sort of more to life than that. So she has to, she has to go into the human realm, basically. Um, yeah, so as I said, it, 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 at the centre of the wheel is, uh, are these sort of three poisons and that's sort of driving the wheel of life, basically. Um, but it's not permanent, that's the thing. Um, so in each of these realms, traditionally it's said there are Buddha seeds, basically. Uh, so it's always possible, no matter what state we're in, to cultivate some awareness. Um, and uh, when we do that, uh, that's when we're able to sort of transcend our predicament, basically. And that's when we get off the wheel and onto the spiral. Um, so you'll see around the edge of the, the wheel of life here, there are these links, basically, uh, which, which sort of characterise that existence. And I'm not going to go into all of these because there are, there are 12 of them. Uh, but there's a point where, uh, it's a little bit about like what Liam was saying, there's a point where there is a, a, a stimulus and then... There's a kind of a there's a gap where we can choose how we respond, uh, and that's the point where we can get off the wheel and onto the spiral. Um, so, when we're able to see what's happening, and we're able to see, ah, okay, that's the stimulus. I can now choose how I respond. That's the point where we can get off the wheel and onto something more creative, basically. Um, and traditionally, this, uh, those links are said to happen over lifetimes, uh, but actually they also can just happen in our experience over and over again. And there's a certain point between feeling and craving that is said to be um, you know, the point when we can cultivate awareness, but actually that can happen any time. Uh, I noticed this myself the other day where I was in a... Um, I was just sat on YouTube, basically. I think I was a bit grumpy in the afternoon. 
and I sat on YouTube and I was sort of already in that craving point where I'm sort of watching YouTube videos and something else there. But then I noticed that there's something else available, basically. Even though you're already in that craving, it's like that the wheel comes around again and there's a point there where you can choose to get off it. And the way that you do that is just that moment of awareness and then you don't respond. Because as soon as you respond, you get back into that sort of wheel. Whereas choosing not to respond takes you off the wheel and onto the spiral. Um, so the, the Bhante also talks about this. I haven't got much time to go into this now, but um, he talks about the spiral and he uses uh, traditional Buddhist uh, teaching of the seven factors of enlightenment. Um, so there are these qualities uh, which are... Um, I wonder whether to go through all of these. I won't go through all of these because we're getting a bit low on time. But they're basically more and more progressively positive states of mind that take us towards enlightenment. Uh, and those are available to us through this uh, sort of portal of awareness, basically. When we do that and we don't respond, what it does is it creates a space where more and more positive mental states can arise. And to the extent that we can stay in that awareness, uh, those positive mental states uh, can become stronger and stronger. Um, the reason why, one of the reasons why I like this metaphor of the spiral is uh, I think it's important because what we can think is that somehow this journey towards um, uh, you know, enlightenment, infinitely more positive mental states, that somehow that's going to be like a straight line, or that it's simple and it's, there's a kind of a, you know, a simple, easy way forward. But actually, I really like that image of the spiral, because it's not just up and up, it's not in a straight line. It's like we circle around the difficulties that we have, or the negative mental states that we have, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an upward trend, basically. Um, and I think we can probably find that in our experience. I find that in my experience, where it's like, it's not that I've completely, obviously not that I've completely eradicated mental states, but each time we circle around them, they get somehow, um, they have less purchase over you, or they have less hold on you, or they're not as severe, or you don't feel the... Uh, you're not compelled to act in, in such a way as you were before. And that becomes subtler and subtler as you, um, as you practice more, basically. So that you still experience negative mental states, but you don't need to act on them. And it's like their power almost becomes fainter and fainter as time goes on. But with those seven factors of enlightenment, I'll just say something about the first one, because the first one is smirti, which means awareness. So it's like there's that awareness that we can find uh, in the wheel. There's like that spot where as we cultivate awareness, we then are onto the spiral. Uh, and then the first of those factors of enlightenment is awareness. Like that's where it starts is with awareness. Um, so that's really, really clear. Also, I was reflecting on this a little bit and I was thinking that the, the, the other thing about the spiral in the wheel is... Um, we can think, or I sometimes can think, you know, it's as simple as, um, uh, like, we can't stay, we can't always stay in positive mental states, perhaps because things aren't going well for us, if we're challenged or we're stressed or something like that. But actually, my experience is it's not, it, it's actually difficult to bear positive mental states sometimes. Does that make sense to people? Like, it was almost like when I was away on this trip for two weeks, I was, I was so sort of blissful at points for long periods of time that I can only stay that in that place for a certain period of time. It's a little bit like it's uncomfortable for me. Um, I mean, it's a nice problem to have, isn't it? But, uh, you know, it's like we can't actually bear too much of this. Um, you know, it's a little bit like if you've experienced higher states in meditation. We think that that's what we want, but actually, uh, sometimes it's so strong that it can feel like it's a bit too much. And I noticed myself, after like two weeks of feeling like that, that I, I wanted to sort of come down to something that was a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more habitual. 
And then maybe you need to stay there for a little bit and then maybe you can step back up a little bit. So I think that image of the spiral is lovely. It's like there's an upward trend, but it's not just straight up. Uh, it's not as simple as that. It's not how our minds work. Um, okay, so I'll wrap up uh, and just say, you know, it's very, very clear what Bante's saying is we are creating our experience all the time with what we do with our mind. Uh, and I think it's really good just to reflect on that and just to bear that in mind. Like, it's us who creates our experience. If you don't like your experience, or if you do like your experience, uh, it's coming from your mind. Uh, that You cannot but experience the world but through your mind. And what is showing up in your life will often be to do with the mental states that you're inhabiting. Um, and, uh, yeah, you might not like it. You know, but that's sort of how it is. I was thinking about this earlier today and I was thinking there are some truths that are uncomfortable, but actually that's how it is. But I find that very, very liberating. You know, actually, it's like it, whatever we're experiencing is down to our own mental states uh, and, or we can have an influence. Uh, we can influence how we work with what shows up in our experience. Um, because often I think we don't always see a link between uh, our suffering and our own um, sort of lack of awareness or our own, you know, that are not cultivating sort of positive mental states, basically. Um, but the fulfilment that we crave, you know, that what we're looking for, that sense of, um, uh, you know, sort of fulfilment, happiness, uh, that the Buddha represents, that is available to us, but it, it's down to what we do with our minds, basically, and it's down to uh, how much time we spend in the reactive mind and how much time we spend in the creative mind. And the more time we spend in that creative mind, that cumulatively builds to more and more positive mental states, uh, which ultimately leads us to enlightenment. Okay, so I'll leave it there for this evening. And uh, yeah, come back next week and we'll have uh, uh, another one of Sangharakshita's classics uh, next week. And uh, yeah, somebody will be talking about another of their favourite teachings from him. Okay, so have a good week, everyone, and uh, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.